Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest today is Karen McPhee. Welcome, Karen. Nice to be here, Rick. Yeah, we'll introduce Karen in more detail in a minute. Uh, I just want to say in general that this is a show uh, on which people who have had or are in the process of having a spiritual awakening are interviewed. There have been over 300 of them now. And if you're new to this, go to batgap.com and you'll see them all archived in various ways under the past interviews menu. Um, these shows, uh, if, if done on Skype, are also live streams that people can watch and send in questions that they would like me to ask. On the upcoming interviews page, there's a form at the bottom that you can fill out to submit a question. And the whole thing is supported by appreciative listeners and viewers, so if you feel like helping to support it, there's a donate button there. So, I enjoyed preparing for Karen's interview. She has had quite a life and is still having one, <laughs> and has been through an awful lot. And um, so, this I think this interview will turn out to be somewhat biographical and, and also just a lot of interesting knowledge that will come out, uh, which Karen has amassed as she's gone through life. Um, so, with Karen, we can start pretty young. Um, she said that from a very young age, she could sense and see the invisible energetic dimension from a, uh, and had the awareness of presence in early childhood. Then you had, uh, maybe you'd like to elaborate on that before I go on to the next one. Well, uh, there's one scene that uh, comes to mind where, you know, it was really vivid and I was very young, maybe three or four, and someone came up behind me and I couldn't hear them or see them, but I felt their presence and I knew what they were feeling, what they were thinking, and at the same time just aware of this huge space of stillness in which it was all happening. Hmm. So it was, it was very vivid. Must have been for you to, for you to have remembered it. Um, it's still here now. Yeah, yeah. You know, don't you find that those moments of timelessness, I mean, they're timeless, so it's always available, but yeah. Yeah. I had one when I was a really little kid, I must have been under three, where I was so convinced that I was actually able to fly around the house, up and down the stairs and all that. I, I remember having an argument with my mother about it. Yeah, I, I fly, you know, and she said, no, dear, you don't fly. But I, I can still remember the experience <laughs> of actually zooming up the stairs and, and so on. So I must have been some kind of out-of-body thing or something. Oh, that's so cool. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Great. And so and it's true. I mean, when we're, when we're in our energy body or whatever you want to call it, we are flying, right? Yeah. And you literally can, I believe. Um, can even do it in your physical one if you're, if you're, you know, evolved enough. Um, then, I mean, skipping quite a few years here, uh, at the age of 16, you had a cancer diagnosis and that you, you count that as a significant milestone. It really was. Um, yeah, almost everything between the first experience we talked about and that is kind of a, a blur, really. But mm -hmm. that, it stands out again because I think I might have shared that with you. There was a moment, and I don't remember where it was in the process. Um, it might have been, I don't know if it was before or after the surgery. I can't remember. Anyway, bottom line. You had once, surgery for the cancer? Yeah. You do you mind my asking what kind of cancer it was? Or thyroid? thyroid. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. I don't even see the scar there. Yeah. Um, so... I remember when I got the call, uh, you know, the doctor said on the phone, hey, you've got cancer. And it was like, Ey. you know, the humanness was pretty shocked. Mm. Um, I remember just passing the phone to my dad and like, Ey. but uh, partway through, um, there was this moment when I was standing outside in our driveway, actually, and I, everything just got perfectly still. Mm. And this knowing arose that this life was not going to be what I thought it was. Yeah. It's kind of unusual for a young girl to get thyroid cancer, isn't it? Uh, probably not where we lived. Uh, it, was, it, it was, we didn't live there long, but it was a fairly, um, I don't say common, but not as uncommon. The environmental toxins? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Probably. Probably. Although uh, there, there's some propensity. I think my great grandmother might've had something there mm. and so genetic as well, hmm. but it was really interesting because I, you know, you can always tell in hindsight, that moment was the moment when awareness woke up and to some degree and realized, okay, 
white picket fence, kids, whatever. And that's not what this is about. And somehow I felt like I had been removed from normal life. Mm. And I didn't know what it meant at the time, but it was, it was just a vivid and clear space of awareness and knowing. And that impression stayed with you as the, as the four-year-old impression also stayed, right? Yeah, this one though, I would say it was probably pretty covered over for a long time. Um, I mean, it was there, but things became pretty turbulent for a while. And right. there was about a 10 year period after that of dealing with stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but yeah. I think I also heard you say you were raped at the age of 13 or something, right? Yeah, I didn't put that in the bio I sent you. I purposely left a few things out oh. that I didn't necessarily want to talk about here. But hey, oh. that's okay. I just trust whatever happens yeah. is fine. Don't worry, Rick. Um, it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I just, uh, there is a little bit of consciousness of sometimes when we talk about things that can trigger trauma. But you know what? Whatever happens here is perfect. Yes, so that happened before actually the cancer. Yeah, three, about three years before. It's It's kind of a... Uh, interesting is the wrong word, but it, it's, uh, there's a number of people whom I've interviewed who have gone through that, and I've, I, when I interviewed Joan Harrigan on Kundalini Vidya, um, one of the things she says can somehow catalyze or trigger a Kundalini awakening is some kind of severe trauma. Not that we would wish that upon anyone, but it, it can be the cause of jolting the, the Kundalini out of dormancy or something. Have you heard that? Uh, I sure have, and uh, I love that interview, by the way. It was yeah. great. Um, you know, and, and if you look at it sort of from the energetic, the chakras, all the whole, which, you know, I don't claim to be an expert at, and, you know, we could say, was it really a coincidence that then the cancer happened here? Because as part of that violation, I was choked. Mm -hmm. And, of course, then there's a the thing about expression and whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, okay. Then in your early 20s, you tried psychotherapy, which started to create greater self-awareness. And then later in your 20s, someone gave you a book on meditation. Perhaps I should have paused after the first bit, psychotherapy, in case there's anything you wanted to say about that. Well, actually, you know, it's just really useful. Yeah. And if you have a conscious uh, practitioner, mm -hmm. which I did, they can really help, um, I don't know, a couple of ways. One is to, to help see through more of that fictional sense of self and encourage self-awareness. So yeah, actually it was very helpful. Yeah. You start to notice what was previously, previously unconscious. Yeah, and in general it sounds like you were, I don't know if you would have called yourself a seeker, but you were. I mean, you were like, the white picket fence wasn't enough, as you said, and, and you were kind of like looking for deeper meaning and resolution of stuff. Oh. Absolutely. That is common the whole way through. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that um, there was also a sort of a darkness that had come on me when I was younger. I, again, I didn't write about this, but um, you could call it a depression or something, but there was like a, a darkness and it, it, it did it, on one hand, it, you know, you could say it was harmful or helped suppress the expression of self. But on the other hand, it was another thing that was bringing me into this other awareness of, whoa, you know, just doing the things normal people do, that's not fulfilling. And there was something, again, I just felt separated from all of that. Mm. And that, that theme kept coming up over and over as well. Yeah. As if you were kind of shrouded or... or... Until, um, yeah, until around the time we're talking, without, except, you know, there were those moments of clarity, mm -hmm. but yes, there was that there was something that was pushing. Looking back on it now, it seems like some, it was like a sort of protracted dark night of the soul. Something was trying to come through the dark to the light. Yeah. And so the dark actually had a purpose in that sense. Huh. I, I think everything has a purpose. <laughs> no argument here. Yeah. I mean, there's no coincidence and no accident. <clears throat> um, okay. So then somebody gave you a book on meditation. You remember what that book was? I don't remember what it was called, but mm -hmm. it was um, someone who was related to Edgar Cayce, okay. his partner. Mm. 
And she, yeah, but no, I'm sorry, I don't remember what it was called. That's okay. But somehow or other, the book was adequate. I know when I first started getting into the meditation, I was reading books and trying this and that, and I just couldn't get into it. But it sounds like you actually were able to just naturally get into a state of meditation. Pretty much right away, yeah. I, and I, it's not like I became really devoted to the practice or anything, but I, I, I just knew this was important. Now, something else that happened right at the same time, I was in a situation that was rather challenging. And uh, to get a little spooky here, mm. the other thing that happened was I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would feel, s let's say, someone mm. touching my arm. And then I'd come fully awake and I'd still be feeling it and there'd be no person standing there. Mm -hmm. And it, later I realized it was angels and yeah. they started to communicate with me and give me some life guidance. So that kind of all happened around the same time. Nice. I think I recall you saying that either now or at times in your life, you have rather routinely perceived angels or other subtle beings. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the work that I do now, it's, it's very much part of it. Yeah. yeah. I, I just sort of lump that all into, I call it the other dimension, just because it's, you know, it's obviously more than one dimension, but just to sort of differentiate it from our, our normal yeah. consciousness. But yes. I think it's important, though, I mean, without getting all hung up on it and obsessed with it, because it's like, an analogy I thought of is if, if we wanted to sort of understand how big the Pacific Ocean is, for instance, we could like imagine how far it is to Japan and how far it is up to Alaska and way, way down to Antarctica and all. And we kind of get a sense of the, the surface area of the Pacific Ocean. But if we do that without considering how deep it is, it's mm -hmm. like we've just covered the, the most superficial aspect of it in a way, how deep it is and what it contains. And it's sort of like that with talking about life and you know th there's this vertical dimension or this subtle dimension which is just teeming with with life and intelligence and and most people are completely unaware of it you know which yeah i love that metaphor of the ocean because it's infinitely deep and yeah. i love that it's beautiful and you know ultimately it's all one but the one is expressing you know as you often say as as all of this whether we can see it or not so yeah Besides, I have no control over it. It's always sort of been here, right, yeah. through most of the time, so yeah. Just, we'll move on from this, but another analogy I think of is, you know, imagine if aliens landed on the White House lawn, what a big deal that would be, or <laughs> Prime Minister's lawn, or whatever you have in Canada. And uh, it's like the, this huge news story, because wow, other beings exist besides the human. And, you know, yet here we are completely surrounded by a uh, you know, vast teeming horde of subtle beings whom the vast majority of people don't see and don't even know exist, and you know they're they're all around us, and that that should be a big news story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, wasn't that on the cover of Life or Times or something? Oh, about, do like, angels something, exist or something? Yeah, and something yeah. you know, eighty percent of the people believe in them or whatever. So maybe yeah. it's more than we think. Yeah. Anyway, that's a bit of a sidelight, but um, it's interesting to me. Um, all right, so then you uh, you were watching PBS. You can see I did my homework, and um, you heard Deepak Chopra say, uh, "Become aware of the one who is watching," and you immediately popped out the back of your body and into the witness. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because every time I share that uh, at a group or whatever, usually somebody will have the experience as well. So let's let's do that again. Okay. And I'll, yeah. So he said. Become aware of the one who is watching. And here it is. Hmm. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Now, in your case, when you had that shift, uh, it never left you. Um, but to play devil's advocate, there are people who advocate and people who listen to them who try to, uh, to um, they make a conscious effort throughout the day to be aware of the one who's watching, be aware of the one who's watching. And to me, that speaks of a sort of manipulation that is kind of unnatural. Uh, I bet you that in your case, it's not something you have had to do ever since watch, seeing that TV show with Deepak. It's just something that has been kind of a natural feature of, you, of your way of functioning. Am I right? Hmm. Well, boy, this is, as you know, Rick, pretty challenging to talk about mm -hmm. 
Um, and the way I look at it is it, it, it really depends on what's happening. You know, there's no problem with getting completely immersed in whatever you're focusing on, whatever your activity is, whatever <laughs> drama is coming up. Mm -hmm. So it's not, but it, that's always there and there's sort of a confidence in it over time yeah. right that you don't it's sort of like you don't have to keep checking because it's it's just there it's known yeah like breathing or like yeah. like being cleaner because you took a shower in the morning you know yeah. <laughs> i mean yeah it's just there it's just there and so there's not a seeking for it and there is also a loving of it so yeah. i still you know love to just be quiet be silent yeah. and sort of almost luxuriate in that you know yeah. and it's delicious. Or another example would be like being awake in the ordinary waking state. I mean, you wake up in the morning and you go through your day and you don't have to keep thinking, I am awake, I'm awake, I'm not sleeping, I'm awake. You know, it's just you're in the waking state and it's just the natural way you are until you go to sleep. So to me, that higher consciousness or witnessing or any of these things should be that natural. Well, and it, and it is. Yeah. All that ever happens is our attention goes elsewhere. So it's pretty basic, really. Yeah. That's my take on it anyway. And the reason I make a point of it is I think people can tie themselves up in knots, uh, kind of manipulating their mind and trying to do two things at once and, oh, who am I? And yet I have to make this phone call. And, you know, it's, 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 there's like this sort of, it actually increases mental agitation sometimes if people go about it in a kind of an unnatural way. At least that, that's my little pet peeve. <laughs> yeah, and I think sometimes with practices, we, you know, there's a, there is a, almost like a period, it's sort of like a, you know, a bridge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where you, you have a realization and there's a period of sort of stabilizing or embodying it, let's say. Yeah. And so during that period, it can be like, you know, um, awkward or it seems Fragile. like it has to be intentional. You mm -hmm. have to, right? But that's, you know, we can talk about how true that is but that's the experience and then you know it's it's like um what's that thing i learned this in coaching but it's in psychology too there's sort of um unconscious incompetence uh conscious incompetence conscious i don't i forget how it goes until you get to the point where you're like when you're learning to drive a standard yeah at first you have to think of all the your two feet and whatever and then after a while, you can shift without thinking about it, shift gears, right? And that's drive, a good point. Steer. Yeah, that's so, a very yeah, good point. So, yeah, it's like that. So you do have to be intentional for a while often, yeah. depending on what's happened. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, then it becomes more, more natural. Yeah, uh, point well taken. I mean, sports are like that, too. Like if you're learning to ski, there, you know, you have to sort of, you might be taking lessons and you're kind of paying attention to your technique and everything. And then after a while, it gets kind of the muscle memory, you know, just kind of automatic and you don't think about it much. You just spontaneously do it the right way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So why would it be any different, you know, because we're, we're sort of training the, the mind or whatever. So the same. Yeah. And from what, all that we know about neuroplasticity and, and so on, it's, we are literally sculpting the brain as, as, and establishing new grooves, so to speak, in the way it functions. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, okay. So after your Deepak... Uh, awakening. <laughs> he said <laughs> everything began to accelerate. You began having spontaneous awakenings or insights that were quite transformative. Want to talk about a few of those? Yeah, uh, we'll see what comes up. It was a long time ago, but yeah, it's uh, it was a really intense period, I have to say. Mm. And uh, a couple things happened. One is I um, I met someone who became my partner who had been with a guru. And so up until that time, I was just going around not knowing what was happening to me. And he came along. So he was able to sort of put some context around what was happening. But, um, and he was also really very present and conscious. So that was probably supportive as well. But I remember one time in particular, a couple of times, where just, it's like the, you know, reality just woke up. And I mean, uh, um, the awareness of what's actually happening here sort of just, became known for the first time, not just that background of awareness, but what's happening here in the apparent world of form. And so one time I was um, sitting in the back seat of a car and we we're driving down the road and I just turned and looked beside me and suddenly real, went into, you know, just unity consciousness and recognized mm. the person beside me and I were one. Mm. And that was beautiful. It was pure love. And then I noticed, I actually could see the full egoic structure operating that they were 
so boxed in with their reality and identified. I could see it was weird. I don't know how I saw it, but I knew they were identified with their car. This is me and mine and their body and purposefully um, ignoring or denying their oneness with me and all of life. So it was the first time I actually saw, you know, the ego and how it works. And it was, it was quite shocking. Mm. Of course, the first time I saw it externally, and then later I would see it in myself. But yeah, it was like, wow. Interesting. Yeah, I keep, I'm thinking of a, a poem right now. Who's the, the, you know, that we're ordinarily boxed up in the chinks of our cavern. I forget who that mm. was. Anyway, um, you, you, you almost made it sound like that's intentional, that one is kind of in one's ego and here's my car and this is me. But it's something that one has to hold on to to keep it going that way and that if, if you relaxed, it would, it would go away. Wow, that's really neat you picked up on that. And so it's not, I would say it's not conscious. Right. So in the, on that level, we couldn't say that person's intentionally doing that. It's just maybe we'll say learned, right? Mm -hmm. How the identification starts to happen. Ingrained, so, habituated. Yeah, but there's something there that knows it's doing it, but we're not conscious of it. That's, that's kind of what the experience was. Yeah. Does that resonate, Rick? It does. And if it were truly intentional, then, uh, you know, in a, in a totally conscious way, then it would sh should be something we should just be able to drop at a moment's notice when, when it was pointed out to us or when we wanted to drop it. But exactly. obvi obviously that's not people's experience. Exactly. It's not conscious. And that's why in these moments of illumination, that's when it's seen the rest of the time. I've never seen that before. Right. So, yeah, yeah. it was just, you know, there's a, a teaching, um, called the miracle of love and uh you know the masters of that who since uh passed over they talk about it as the illusion and i'm not an expert in their teaching but it's just that just popped into mind it's like you know we, we don't know how we're creating the sense of separation because there's sort of they talk about sort of a mass illusion and then a, maybe a, a personal experience of that or joel goldsmith talks about um, the world mind uh, hypnosis. So it, it is, it's a kind of hypnosis, but we're not conscious of it. Neither would be someone who's been hypnotized, you know, on stage or something, right? They wouldn't be aware that they're going around barking like a poodle or, or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think uh, zooming out to a cosmic perspective on it, if, if really, if we take non-duality seriously, and if it's really all one, mm -hmm. you know, if we are God sort of having a human experience, or then, then it almost seems like consciousness intentionally shrouds itself in the process of interacting with itself in, and thereby giving rise to the appearance of forms and embodying itself in those forms. But it, it's just part of the divine play. Sounds good to me. <laughs> so we're just really talking about that place where, I mean, it's one thing if you, if there's an underlying realization of oneness and that this, this separation is an appearance. Obviously, we, that's a very different experience than, than believing we're separate, cut off from the source. So it's sort of, it's, maybe we could say there's a, well, the word that just came to me was corruption. Hmm. I'm not sure I like that, but maybe a distortion would be better on hmm. top of whatever conscious. And of course, yeah, if there is only God, what else, omnipresence, right? What else could there be? But a lot of teachings talk about how this distortion happens and it limits our experience. So I don't know. Yeah, no, that's good. There's a there's a Sanskrit word phrase, uh, pragya parat, which means mistake of the intellect, and that at some kind of primordial in, initial initial emergence level, uh, a mistake is made, and and then that that uh, that corruption, as to use your word, gets sort of multiplied and magnified and, and, and more and more and more enmeshed in, uh, in delusion as, as greater and greater apparent diversification happens. And then we have to retrace our steps eventually. <laughs> <laughs> what you said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you took Reiki classes and... Uh, uh, okay, hold oh, on, oh, wait. Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry, let's go back for a second. So during that period, um, there were quite a few moments of that of just seeing through this 
sort of fictional part, this uh, mind-made separation. Mm -hmm. And but there was this also real increase in intensity going on, mm. um, and seeking and looking for, you know, what is this and how does it become stable? And I was introduced to a number of teachers and books and all of that. Um, so it was a really potent time. Mm. Yeah. This, what, what age range were you in then? Um, early 30s, I guess. Mm -hmm. Something like that. And did you find that, um, well, you said you were in a relationship with this guy. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask as a broader question. It's a little out of context of what we're talking about right now, but whether you have found all this intensity and all this kind of evolutionary fervor to have been conducive or uh, not conducive, inconducive to relationships, you know, partnerships and so on. Wow, good question. It's not what I thought you were going to ask. That's funny. <laughs> um, I thought you were going to ask if it was conducive to, you know, awakening or whatever we want to well, call it. Well, definitely this. conducive to that, I would say. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, but sometimes people find it hard to straddle both worlds, you know, the, the, the kind of pedal to the metal awakening track with some semblance of normalcy in the world track. Well, okay. And, and so in my case, um, I would say then this wasn't a normal relationship. Mm -hmm. It was really all about the spiritual unfoldment and that was really our common ground mm. I mean there was love and all of that stuff but no and it was I think pretty clear that very soon anyway after that this was the priority mm -hmm. yeah do you mind my asking and is it relevant uh, what guru that guy had been with Adida oh I was, for some reason I was thinking that where are you? Are you picking up on the psychic realm there? I don't know <laughs> why. And also, someone, um, uh, I can't remember his name off the top, but someone who was with Maharishi as well, because my partner had been to MIU and mm -hmm. I think he got his degree there and he was a, uh, he did all the cities and was an mm. advanced practitioner, whatever you call that, Probably in no that one. system. Yeah. yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, there's a, several people I've interviewed who are with Adida, and boy, he was a conundrum. But, um, oh, I agree. Yeah, <laughs> I, definitely. I was never attracted there, but yeah. it was just again having been in that whole realm. It was helpful to me because he had the experience with Maharishi and Adi Don and this other fellow that he was with. Yeah. Okay. So then I was going to start talking about the Reiki classes and the the visitations from divine beings, which uh, seemed to result from awakenings and that you, that the Reiki was triggering. Um, yeah, how that ended up happening was I was staying with my parents for a while and my dad brought this book home called Healing from the Inside Out by Sherry Pearl and he'd seen it at the library and it was a young woman who'd also been ill in her 20s. I don't remember if her illness was cancer as well, but when I read it, it opened up this whole other thing about the pot. She had been healed mm -hmm. by a um, famous healer from England whose name escapes me at the moment and so it just... It, it, that's what sort of planted the seeds that led to me apparently taking the, the healing training, Reiki and whatever else. Mm. And so it was, uh, it was, it's funny, a couple times in the unfoldment, um, and this was one of them, I went to a public talk on Reiki and I got up and I felt hands, there was nobody standing there, so we're talking angelic or whatever, hands pushing me forward to go and talk to the teacher. And I just heard myself say, okay, I'm signing up. So it was one of those things where I wasn't driving that bus mm. and it just, it happened. And it turned out really great because with each level you study, there's something called an attunement. And with each attunement, I, I had openings, awakenings, whatever you want to call them. And I had visitations from beings from other dimensions that were informing me about my path mm. and that this was part of it. And it was very pure. The energy and the experience so i feel like it was significant somehow that's neat i bet you some people are thinking now gee i wish i'd have visitations from beings from other dimensions who inform me about my path <laughs> but uh i have a friend who quite routinely sees all this subtle stuff and and he says that in any given situation there are more subtle beings in a room than there are gross beings that, that each of us have like usually two or three of them in attendance that are kind of helping us in ways that he doesn't fully understand, but that 
seems very uh, important. I would agree with that completely. And when we get to talking about it, the when I started doing what I'm doing now, um, the room is pretty much packed when I'm doing a session, and it's it's not something I invoke or anything. It just it just happens. And I agree with your friend. It's not like it's understood. It's just, it, you know, it's it's wonderful and it's helpful and it's a real privilege to be aware of it. I think we all are. Just you know, it's just tuning into that channel. Yeah. I was communicating with a friend the other day um, who is, like myself, an uh, old XTM teacher. But um, we, we used to do a ceremony of gratitude when we instructed people in TM, and we'd kind of recite the names of the tradition of masters going back thousands of years um, from whom that teaching came. And she said, well, you know, when you did that, didn't you see them in the room? And I said, no, I didn't have, there was a profound feeling, but I didn't see them in the room. She said, well, you were invoking them. They all came, uh, you know, so they're all they're all there on, on the other side, if we want to call it that. And, um, you know, they can be invoked and, uh, you know, can intercede or have various influences. Yes. And it's wonderful, actually. It makes life very rich. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when I started doing Reiki, I didn't realize that, um, I don't know, I... <laughs> I don't have sort of, you know, a belief system about this, but as a useful mm -hmm. metaphor, whether it's true or not, is if we talk about past lives, mm -hmm. you know, it's like maybe this was where, where it came in from, medicine you brought in from another life. But from pretty much the first time I did a treatment, this other vision opened up and I could see people's departed loved ones mm -hmm. or one time... I was working on a pregnant woman and it was like watching the discovery channel. I suddenly was like watching this cameras pan down the fetus and huh. saw the sex of the baby and the color of its hair and things that they all proved true. So I'm, I'm like, I didn't know it was extraordinary, but it was a time of great delight and wonder and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So yeah. That's cool. It we're was cool. We're going to get to a point in your story where all this goes away, at least for a while. So just... Yes. Uh, tipping people off to that but you know I mean would you would you agree with this would you say that all this stuff is wonderful and and interesting if it's happening but that it shouldn't people shouldn't make it a goal to you know put that their first priority to see this subtle stuff if, if, if it happens as a side effect of a deeper shift that's taking place then then great I completely agree with that yeah yeah, for me, it's not uh, it's not something that we as an apparent individual are want to be driving. We're re almost like recipients or instruments or whatever is more is more appropriate. So yeah, I, I never go looking for it. It's just there. Yeah. Um. So just one other thing that comes to mind. I'm not sure if I put this in the notes, but uh, that happened when I was doing Reiki. That one, there were a couple things that caused a big turn in my life. Uh, one of which was. While doing a Reiki session, I went, first of all, I started to notice after a while that I was taking credit for it. So mm -hmm. some ego was getting in there. So that was noticed. So that was kind of like, okay, red flag. But the, at the same time, paradoxically, what was also happening is this desire to serve, this selfless, sense of selfless service was coming up. And my heart was really breaking open and I was feeling this incredible love for people when I was working on them. Mm. And this one session in particular, I think it might have been the last one I did, I just completely disappeared into love and, you know, being a divine instrument. Mm. And it was I just, there was nobody there. It was just love. And so that, that was like, okay, this is what's important, not being a healer or any of the rest of this. It's about serving and it's about love. I love that. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Yeah. That's it. Prayer of St. Francis. That's it, Rick. Amen yeah. to that. Yeah. Absolutely. And that really almost erupted from my heart. It had been building for a long time. But in this one particular session, it reached this intensity of, wow, this, that's all. And also, of course, a recognition of oneness. Yeah. That's beautiful. You know, I mean, if, again, if it's all consciousness, then we are all instruments of the divine. But the divine is multi-faced, you know, and as Bob Dylan saying, you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it's like, it's a, a blessing and, and I think a choice to a certain extent to put oneself in the service of the sort of the, the more positive qualities that 
would, that the divine would like to infuse into the world. Of course, there also need to be destructive qualities and so on because it's, it's a world of polarities. But it's, it's kind of, a, you know, better to be on the white hat team, in my opinion, as far as one's own enjoyment is concerned. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'll second that motion. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so if, I, I like the way we're doing this where I'm reading stuff, but you're kind of interjecting if there's something that, you know, I'm leaving out or that your notes are leaving out. Um, so your meditations were deepening, your spiritual search was intensifying, f sitting four hours a day and having many insights and releases. Um, nice quote from Ananda Maima came along that touched you to the core. It was something about stopping short of nothing but uh, prior to full self-realization and that all the experiences could be a distraction from that main goal. Right, and so that sort of coincided with that experience I was just describing of breaking open into love and the desire to serve as, and the, you know, the selflessness. At the same time, that quote came to me and I had been sitting longer and longer each day mm -hmm. and just going deeper and deeper into that inner reality. It was pretty blissful, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. um, but those two things came together and then it, it's like, I don't know, it's been a long time, but probably the experience was that I just completely lost interest in that other dimension. And I think some of the other teachings were saying, you know, this stuff is a distraction. Once there's self-realization, then you can do what you want. Yeah. And it, it just, there was, the yearning was there anyway. And between that and that, that selfless service, that recognition of oneness, I just got, it's almost like the search got really focused and amped up at that point. Patanjali says that in the Yoga Sutras, actually, he says that, um, you know, the, this involvement with celestial beings can, can be a distraction or can be a, a stumbling block, you know, can get caught up in it, waylaid on your path. I, 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 yeah, I think that's true, and I, I've certainly seen it. And uh, perhaps I had an advantage in the sense that I never went seeking for that. It just showed up. Yeah. And I, I always saw it as an incredible gift or bonus, mm -hmm. you know. But the, the true seeking for enlightenment or whatever we want to call it, that was the thing. That was primary. Yeah. So it was pretty easy to, but it's interesting because many years later, this will probably come up, but many years later, this curiosity started coming, okay, where did all that stuff go? Because mm -hmm. it was like, you know, everything withers from disuse or right. whatever. So, that yeah. to which we give our attention grows stronger grows, in our lives. Yeah. 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 Down in New Orleans, they, when you buy something, they'll, they'll throw something a little extra in the bag, and it's called the lanyap. And uh, I always remember that word. But um, so, you know, all this flashy stuff, it's just a little something extra that might get thrown in the bag as we go along, but it, it's not the main <laughs> product that you're, that you're going for. <laughs> That's wonderful. I love that. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, okay. So then um, a major awakening happened through the breakup of that relationship that you referred to. Your heart broke open into a greater love and you fell into God communion. Um, so powerful that rep repercussions of it echoed through the next 15 years. So everybody's been through breakups and uh, it's something that people all want to understand more and perhaps would appreciate understanding the evolutionary significance of rather, rather than seeing it as merely a trauma or a heartbreak. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, and uh, please forgive me because I don't actually remember what ha happened in what order. So doesn't I might matter. have it a little bit out of order there, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing was that, that that relationship on the human level was very challenging. Mm. Spiritually, it was great, but uh, there were some issues. Mm. <laughs> really big issues and one of them was in the area of commitment or lack thereof yeah and you know I can see it very differently now but you know it's the commitment here was actually for God anyway so to accuse the other of being uncommitted was a, a you know a little questionable anyway <laughs> but yeah. for some reason life used that as you said there's only life and so this intensity came and when but I think Rick, part of it was because this man wasn't just my partner, he was my mentor, my guru, my guide. Uh, you know, it, it was there was so much more to it. Um, that couldn't have been 100% the case because you've got so much going on that you must have been his guide to a very great extent as well. 
Well, how lovely for you to say, and perhaps that's true, and, and we, we'd have to ask him. Maybe we can patch him in later. But <laughs> <laughs> but for me, at first, I was much younger and very new to the spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. So thank you, uh, Rick. We can clarify that with, you know, he'd been on the journey for, what, 10, 20 years, whatever, was older than I. In and this, I was in this, this lifetime. In this lifetime. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? right? In this lifetime. So it, there was sort of that position of the... Um, you know, when you, you've got an artist and his protege or whatever, mm -hmm. it was that that was an unbalanced footing that we were standing on because of that. And you're absolutely right. It was really just a experiential or perception. But for sure, there was a lot going on here. Yeah. So I'm sure that had an effect as well. And, it, and he certainly has told me that. However, on the human level, there was some old programming or whatever playing. And suddenly I was like, OK, I just something needed to balance that sense of disempowerment from being in, in that uneven footing. Mm. So there was a breakup, but, and there was incredible pain, partly because of how much more he was to me. He was also sort of a father figure, even though I have a great relationship with my father. Uh, anyway, so it's, again, life used that, and there was a real deep despair and breakdown. It was mm. very intense. However, I just use that to go into God. Yeah. I'm preparing to interview Andrew Harvey next week. I don't know if you know Andrew Harvey, but uh, a delightful person. But anyway, he talks about, he talks a lot about the uh, breaking open of the heart and how he mentions how even certain saints have sort of prayed for their heart to be broken as much as possible. It's like, you know, lay it on me, Lord. And I just, I just want it to break wide open so I can be, you know, to love you fully. Oh, that's it. Exactly. And of course, if, if you're, I wasn't consciously really on, I didn't have a guru or whatever guiding me, mm -hmm. you know, I had some help, but it wasn't a conscious recognition that that's what was happening. But that's where it took me. And that's exactly, it's the best thing ever when the heart breaks open. It's just, exquisite even the pain of it it can be exquisite so i i just went deeper and deeper in oh you're, you're chewing on something should i stop no i yeah mentally chewing on something uh, but you continue i'm just thinking about uh, uh, a little devil's advocate point here uh, to, okay to throw in, okay. but you finish your thought okay thank you uh so there was this combination of exquisite pain and going deeper and deeper into god <clears throat> so i was let's say I'll say praying because I don't know what other word to use, but a real, you know, God had become the complete center of my life anyway. So that's where I turned mm -hmm. uh, with this pain and was didn't what you know didn't have a big enough view of it to go. Oh, please take me into God communion. Just, it was more like please get me out of this pain. Right. But that's what happened. Is something there was a deeper surrender, mm -hmm. and there was actually it even changed my outer form. There was more radiance and it was quite noticeable and I, I just really fell into that space. Nice. My devil's advocate thought was just that, um, you know, the world is full of pain and so many tragic things have happened. I mean, we can, you know, itemize some of the more notorious of them, the, the Holocaust and school shootings and, you know, um, Boko Haram kidnapping those girls and just all kinds of horrible things that happen in the world all the time. And it may seem a little glib, to just say, oh yes, trauma or, or tragedy breaks open your heart so you can love God more. Tell that to somebody whose children have, have just been shot or something. So how do you reconcile that? I mean, and, and also, how do you reconcile that along with the notion that God is omnipresent and merciful and that everything is ultimately in the best interests of our spiritual unfoldment? Uh, how does somebody who's not open to the understanding or experience that um, tragedy is a gift in some uh, sense from God, um, deal with tragedy as compared with someone who, like yourself, who might be blessed with that understanding? Okay, so first of all, um, let's, let's say this. Right now, I'm just speaking from my own life experience. Mm -hmm. So that that that's really good you interjected there so i'm not making a blanket statement that everything harmful is for that purpose maybe i'll say that later but right now i'm just talking about what happened for me so 
that's the first thing. So thank you for interjecting there. Um, I, I think don't you know. had Can an we... advantage in a way, you see, because, I mean, here you had been on this spiritual path. And so it wasn't just, oh, my God, my boyfriend broke up with me. It was more like, oh, this really hurts. But like, OK, God, you know, <laughs> it's like immediately the attention is still in that profound direction that it had been directed in. Hmm. I think we might chew on this one a few times, Rick, because sure. right now I'm sort of... Um, in that, that storyline, but I would say that it it just about killed me. It was so painful. Wow. So I'm, you know, I won't, uh, and, you know, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not downplaying that or anybody else's heartbreak. And, you know, we could, say, there's a lot of ways to talk about this. Uh, you can say anybody who has faith, who goes to church, who prays, maybe that can alleviate as well. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a big topic that you've brought in. I think we need to take it in chunks. And it does actually. I mean, in that shooting in Charleston, South Carolina a few months ago where that guy was in the church and sat through a prayer meeting and then shot everybody in the meeting. And it's like the, the very next day, the relatives of those people were saying, we forgive you and we love you. And I mm -hmm. think I thought, man, how did they do that? You know, it's, it's like it was really very impressive. Oh, no kidding. It's it's stunning, really. It's amazing. Yeah. It's to me it's grace. Yeah. And that's this whole thing is grace. So I don't look at having had an advantage. I know what you're saying, but for me, I of my own self could not have broken broken my heart open. Mm. It was grace. It was grace. That's a good and, point, you know. We, we don't kind of intentionally put our feet to the fire. We withdraw them. Uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and every moment of this has only been grace. There isn't anybody who can take credit for it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So we're going to break that into chunks. Do you have another chunk? No, I think it's, my sense is it, we're going to touch back on it a okay. couple of times. Okay, yeah, that's Okay, great. Then we probably will. Then, then moving on a little bit. Um, okay, so you... This, this interested me. You said you continued the meditation and began to experience a painful contrast, total bliss while sitting, but then losing it when you interacted with people and situations. And the reason that interested me is that that was never my experience. My experience was always more along the lines of the cloth and dye analogy, which you probably heard, where you know you dip a dye, uh, dip a cloth in the dye, and then bleach it in the sun, and it loses its color over time in the sun, but a little bit remains. Then you dip it again, then bleach it again, and, it, and a little bit more remains. And each time, you know, a little bit more remains. So, for me, it was never a black and white on and off kind of thing. The the bliss of meditation carried over to a certain extent and, and naturally wore off, but then kept getting recharged and just got more and more and more stable over time. So was that also your experience or was it really as black and white as you indicate here? No, it was closer to what you're talking about. I guess what I'm really referring to there is, um, you know, it's that whole thing of no stone left unturned. And so whatever remaining uh, neuroses, whatever, limitations, mm. patterns that were still operating in me, those were getting, um, right. yeah, slammed. Yeah. And that's really what I'm talking about. And it was and kick kicking up the dust as those things unraveled. Absolutely. And I was living with my partner at this particular time I'm talking about. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, I'd have my meditation room, I'd go in the hallway and maybe he'd be grumpy or maybe, uh, you know, I, whatever, there'd be an interaction. And, I, the, you know, the reactions were still coming up, but uh, the rest of the time there was this incredible peace. Mm. And sure, sure, it was there underneath, but I, I, there were just, something was like, okay, the contrast between that reactionary behavior, between any of that and what reality was, this deeper reality, there was just a, it, it created a, a friction, mm -hmm. a tension. It was inviting something. Yeah. Did you find that the deeper the surrender during meditation, the more effective that consciousness could be as a solvent for these, um, you know, these pent up things that needed to be resolved? Yes, uh, I would say, though, that up until this point, I was just sitting yeah. and dissolving and it, I don't know how embodied it was. So what comes next is, and, I, and it feels to me like this is part of 
what was happening, but the blanket answer is yes, absolutely. There was just greater awareness at all times, less reactivity generally. So it was just those particular patterns that were still operating. Um, but I guess what became known is that there, it needed to be more embodied. Mm -hmm. That's really what, I, as I would say, the bottom line was there. Yeah. And the relationship was helping you embody it or <laughs> only the hardest way at, by this point, things were, yeah, not going that well. Yeah. So, yeah. At the science and non-duality conference, I'm going to moderate a discussion between, um, Hamid Ali, A. H. Almas, and Karen Johnson about non-dual relationships, and which in a way is sort of an oxymoron, non-dual relationships. But um, embo the word, the embodiment word, is all the rage these days because I think a lot of people went through a phase of sort of hiding out in the non-dual, either conceptually or actually experientially, and then realizing that wait a minute, I'm a human being and I have a life to live here, and how do I integrate this? You know how. There seems to be, well, just the point we've been addressing, there seems to be this clash between the, the sort of the peace of the transcendent and the hurly-burly of, of my actual life. Um, so let's talk about that more. When you, what, what would you say to that? Hmm. I think part of it is just uh, misunderstanding. Huh. It, it, there's lots of them, but one is that when I first started teaching, let's jump ahead a little bit, the first thing I did was have people, I would guide people through being in this beautiful state, mm -hmm. recognizing awareness, with your eyes closed, perfectly still. Then I'd say, okay, open your eyes, find it there, stand up, find it there, move around, find it there, because there's, it's almost like the form can encourage that. It's the same thing with teaching. There's somebody sitting in the chair and that lends itself to the idea that there's an expert here. Mm -hmm. Same thing with meditation, you sit in that, on that cushion or in that posture. It can, um, if you're not aware of it, bring up this unconscious idea that I, that's where I have to be in order to be in that place. Mm -hmm. So it's not true, but it needs to be seen that there's no special posture needed. I mean, it's wonderful to put down deeper roots and put all your investment in that for a period each day, great, no problem. But as you say, it needs to bleed out, and it really does. Um, there, there just kind of a lot was going on in this particular thing, and it was creating this friction of, okay, this I know this is real, and I feel it all the time, and there's still these intense reactions coming up, mm -hmm. and there was just a need to embody it more. So I think that's true for a lot of people. It's not separate from us. It is us, but we need to know that. I think people know what we mean by embodiment, but just in case it would be valuable, why don't you just define it uh, in a nutshell? Well, w now it's very simple for me. I literally mean in the body. Mm -hmm. What? What's in the body? You. What we are, not just in some abstract um, sense of this beautiful awareness or stillness around us, but to know that is also within the very cells. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like you're, you're walking it, it's walking you. There's no separation. So it, it, it's not conceptual, it's not special, it's not exclusive, it's not limited to certain circumstances and contexts. It's constant and um, omnipresent. Good. And is there anything that one could or should do intentionally to embody the transcendent if they have access to the transcendent to to integrate it or is it something that's going to happen automatically just through the process of living well uh both I and, think and both is it by the same token is it something one can retard by trying to hang on to the transcendent and to the exclusion of of actual you know embodied life well, I think, you know, that phrase, I can't remember who coined it, spiritual bypassing. Yeah, um, Robert Augustus Masters talked about it, and there was somebody before him who, who coined it, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, and I noticed, and I think, again, this is another thing that became uh, conscious, is meditation was, let's say, just for fun, 90% authentic and real and nourishing, and 10% an escape from these things that were still troublesome. Mm -hmm. So to the degree it's an escape, I would say there needs to be a, 
that degree of um, grounding. So what we're trying to escape, you know, there's a lot of stuff. What, what, when we talk about the non-dual, we can talk about this a bit more. But there, it's there's a danger. Pamela Wilson, who a friend who I love, I'm sure you do too. Oh, yeah. She talks about things being from the nose up. Mm -hmm or the nose down. Mm. And so we just have to make sure that, or be watchful, attentive to, if our realization is really up here, it, that's when we won't be experiencing it as we're walking through life, mm. uh, or aware that we are. And as you know, Adyashanti talks about realization in the head, heart, and gut, you know, so, and I think he would probably say that it tends to start in the head. Maybe, maybe it's different for different people, but that it kind of moves down as we get more and more embodied and grounded. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I've certainly had three major openings uh, in those areas. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Were you about to say something? Well, I was just going to probably the next thing on the note there, just say, so how this got resolved was um, the intensity. There was, again, there, there was a lot of fire here. <laughs> I don't know if I should put that in past tense or not, but the <laughs> fire was really burning like, okay, I need to know God and know this a hundred percent. My own efforts seem to be creating more tension, again, that contrast, mm. and it actually reached a breaking point. Uh, it, this isn't logical, it's just how it unfolded. And plus, I'm also, I can only remember so much of it, but just the highlight was. What kind of efforts were creating more tension? Well, here I'm sitting, so it was like, I, the me that I thought I was, mm. I'm doing everything I can. I'm sitting four hours a day, I'm reading all these books, blah, 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 and I'm still having these reactions to my partner. I see. So, you know what I mean? Despite my best efforts, yeah. it ain't working. And this happened to me a couple of times, but this one was, it's like, okay, something just broke. And as, as it tends to be fairly dramatic here, it was like, this is it. I'm not doing one more minute of meditation until I can find something that's stable, mm. lasting, permanent, never comes and goes. Mm. And it was a moment of deep surrender, the loss of all sense of self, breaking open into the divine, and then that was it. I, I stopped meditating that moment. That was, that was it. Yeah. I don't know if that n had to be the, the, the way of going about it, because um, I don't know if necessarily continuing to meditate in any way prevents you from arriving at that which is which doesn't come and go but it's the way you did it so. no and i'm certainly not saying that again this is just my so-called my story yeah and i i thank you rick for clarifying that i'm definitely not making a blanket statement and by the way i do still meditate i do again yeah. but i'm just talking about one of the dramatic moments where more of the ego death more of the surrender more of the recognition i of my own self can't do this and it just was life used this intensity as a way to surrender mm. so that's just what this is what happened it was a big moment and it must have been kind of interesting to see after all those years of meditation what would happen if you stopped doing it you know i mean would you what what you lost what you didn't lose yeah and the thing is that didn't last very long because that we can, you know, I'm not implying cause and effect, uh, cause and effect, but we could say it was, but it was right after that, someone showed up at my house mm -hmm. with a book. Power of now. The power of now. Mm -hmm. And what got my attention is, first of all, I didn't see the book at first. The friend was just talking about this man who spent two years on a park bench. And at that time, when I wasn't meditating and I did just the minimal amount of work to function, like bare minimum, the rest of the time I sat on the park bench oh. by the river. Yeah. So there was like this bing, it was like something new, there was a connection there. Yeah. So it got my attention, then he pulled the book out of his backpack and handed it to me and I you write touched it. it. <laughs> hey, I wish I thought of that, Rick, too bad you weren't there to whisper me a little clue in the mirror. No, I just touched it. Uh -huh. And I just felt this zzz. Hmm. And by then I knew that meant this was something important. Yeah. And so I very rudely said, um, Sia left the poor guy sitting there, drove over to the New Age bookstore, got a copy, <laughs> rushed out to my backyard under the apple tree and started to read it. Hmm. But it was, um, yeah, that was very magical when you talk about that. But it was, I had found just that surrender immediately led to this experience or this experience happened right after that. And it was the answer to what I was looking for. Yeah. It's kind of neat. I mean, I've, I've actually interviewed people who were in a bookstore 
and a certain book would actually literally fall off the shelf and land at their feet, you know, and then they pick it up and they open it up to a certain page, and right there on that page is exactly what they needed to hear. <laughs> Don't you love those stories? I, I think know, that's it's so like, special. it kind of harkens back to the little beings that are following us around. They're, they're probably helping to orchestrate these things. No doubt, and thank you to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, because actually, just as, as an aside, because, you know, fine, you know, intelligence and the, the divine is omnipresent, but within that omnipresence, within the ocean, there are currents. And so there are impulses of intelligence within the ocean of intelligence, and those impulses of intelligence are sentient beings who operate on one level or another and perform certain functions, such as pushing books off shelves if necessary. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So, you entered your Eckhart Tolle phase, and is that the way it's pronounced? Yes. Tolle or Toll? Uh, it's actually neither, but we, Toll, I can't do the true to Tolle or something. So Tolle is better. Yeah, it's something like Tolle. Tolle. It's, it's, I can't remember. I used to know, but it's a long time ago. <laughs> German. Um, and so you started writing letters to Eckhart, and, uh, to his publishing company anyway, and some of them were shared with him. Yeah, what was really cool is I read the introduction, and like probably lots of other people, I, I, something just, my heart was just singing mm. with, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. And there was such resonance. And then as I read the book, I was having these experiences mm -hmm. of what the teaching was going to do and whatever. And so I was sharing them and some of them got passed on to Eckhart. So it was neat. But the main thing is I right away contacted to see if, if there's some way I could meet Eckhart in person. And it turned out he was coming to, to Calgary where I lived mm -hmm. uh, soon after that. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. And tell the story about how you actually met him. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, I call it my Yogananda moment. So uh, the first meeting of the day was somebody had arranged a luncheon uh, with a bunch of people. And Eckhart was, you know, the guest speaker or whatever. And it was on a busy college campus. So we got there and parked. And I was walking towards the door. And there's all these people and students and teachers and whatever. And the people coming to the luncheon. And this man walked right up to me, one of however many people and said something like I know for certain you must be Karen huh. and he'd never seen my picture or heard my voice or anything and I had seen the picture in the book jacket but it wasn't until he said that and I was looking at him I realized oh it's Zachart uh -huh. so that was pretty special yeah that's neat did he ever talk about that later on about how he knew it was you oh probably so I but I don't remember mm -hmm. okay um so great. So later that idea, uh, later that day, you had an opportunity to sit with them, and a recognition happened in which your sense of boundaries dissolved. You knew yourself to be the whole universe. Do you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Um, my sense of it is that it was the first time that I sat with somebody who there were there was nobody there, hmm. so there was absolutely no projections or expectations, or he didn't want anything from me. Mm -hmm. And, and that combined with his very spacious realization, state of being, it just, there was a resonance. And yeah, it, I mean, it's still, I can still feel it. It's still rippling out into eternity. Hmm. A question about Eckhart, actually, since I may or may not ever get a chance to interview him. He's pretty reclusive. But, um, you know, we've he's written several books. I've, I think I've read them all. And, um, but he doesn't talk about his own experience too much anymore, as I see it. And do you, do you get a sense that, like you, like you and like most people, since the awakening he describes in The Power of Now, there's been a vast, vast sort of deepening or unfoldment or refinement or something, and that, he, and that he's still kind of breaking new ground, so to speak? Well, all I can really tell you is from my own perception and experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'll, uh, what I can say is when I first met Eckhart, he seemed almost transparent. Mm. He was so light. Mm. And the last time I spoke to him, which is a few years now, but this would be maybe 10 years later, I don't know. I was speaking to him and the difference was from, to me was palpable. Now, okay, there's the X factor of how much more had it become embodied here, whatever, but I felt he had become so embodied compared to before. So, um, I, I will say, though, that I think with Eckhart, the thing there is that he is, um, I don't think he'd mind me saying, he's very much an introvert, Yeah. as am I, but his is even more so. Um, so 
that's part of why he doesn't share a lot about his experience. Plus, he doesn't think the teacher is the thing, right? The important thing to focus on. He used to say that to us all the time. Yeah. But I, in my experience of him, I feel like um, that state of presence is probably just the same, and it feels more grounded to me. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree the teacher isn't the thing, but I think it's interesting when teachers and people do relate their experience because it helps to clarify the roadmap and help, helps to uh, helps people understand that you know there is this ongoing development and uh, you know and we begin to sort of flesh out the details of it and 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 as as we hear more and more of these stories, there tends to be a a kind of an agreement or convergence between different people's stories and you get you just kind of get a sense of you know how vast the whole thing was is which is i think helpful i think the more as a as a spiritual community in the greater sense we can understand where we're going uh, there's less and less likelihood of thinking that we have arrived and that, that, that that's all there is to it, you know, which, which some people say, you know, they, they don't like any talk of levels or progress or anything else. But the fact of the matter is, speaking honestly and realistically, people keep progressing unless they get, unless they get stuck. Oh, you know, I completely agree with you. And, and if Eckhart ever wrote a true, if there was a biography or an autobiography that really, I, I'd be the first one to buy it. I would love to hear yeah. You know, I only had a few snippets and all the time I spent with him, just a few snippets about what happened in his unfolding. And I would love to hear it. And I always felt, well, after a while, I felt it was almost a disservice not to have that story shared. I totally agree with you. Even though his was extraordinary, I suppose they all are. Yeah. yeah what What was it like? And there, was, there were a few things he shared that really had an impact on me. Mm -hmm. but, but, and I, I think this is something I agree with you. I feel like ultimately there's only one, and it, but it's expressing as these unique individuals and the more that we share the more it serves everyone and I also found and I was guilty of this myself when I was for a while I volunteered as Eckhart's secretary and um, I noticed in myself you know there was this tendency I had to really be conscious of to try to present that he was perfect <laughs> you know this whole thing we do with gurus and then we right. you know like look at some of the great gurus and the stuff that was going on in the background there mm -hmm. so I've you know, I've learned a lot since then, but yeah, there's this thing we want them to be perfect, and by ignoring their humanness and their what they go through, you're right. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it doesn't serve, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, whenever I kind of imagine myself interviewing Eckhart, th this is the line it would take. You know, and, and really sort of trying to grill him on on all the the stages of development that he's undergone in the last 15 years or 20 years or however long it's been. So uh, if that appeals to you, Eckhart, call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I if think I'm people would enjoy again, hearing I'll it. Put in a, yeah, I'll put, put in, in a word. word. Yeah. yeah, I will, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and not to belabor the point, but I, I, I sort of like, I just really think that, you know, both in terms of what you just said, in terms of the fact that people are human and they still have their warts and, and whatnot, but also in terms of the, just the pure spiritual unfoldment that takes place. The more we can hear accounts of it, the, the better we can understand, you know, I, I mean, it's like if only one, if only Lewis and Clark had gone across the U.S. and, and back, we'd have a very rudimentary understanding of the topography of, of, of the U.S., you know, but now it's all been mapped out in such great detail, every square inch, you know, is, is mapped with GPS and whatnot. So it could be that way with spirituality, too, that rather than have it be sort of this vague conjectural thing in many people's minds with so many people defining the same terms differently and therefore not actually communicating, the whole thing could be really um, developed far more thoroughly in the culture and, and become really a, a part of our clear understanding, which I think would be tremendously helpful for the evolution of our civilization and if not the survival of it sure and you know it's part of why we have so many different systems too because the, you know like look at the i can't remember it's been a long time since i studied it what is it the eight paths of yoga right. depending on your Shtanga temperament yoga right you know uh, you know so there's bhakti and all that stuff oh, all those things, the right. intellect yeah. the heart mm -hmm. yeah so it, it, yeah, so as long as it would be inclusive enough, but I, I agree with you and I feel like it's funny as you said that what came to me is I feel like that will happen and it is starting to happen, but I agree. I think the more we share, it's just, 
I can understand why some teachers are reluctant to share that stuff because everybody's experience is unique, but I tend to go more with your view what I'm, if I'm hearing you right, which is the more that the more examples we have, the more likely it is we're going to find something that's closer to what's happening to us. And for myself, you know, there's no complaint about the way things unfolded. And I understand now it sort of had to be the way it was, let's say. However, how much suffering could have been avoided had I had a guide at certain points or a teaching or whatever. So I'm, I'm with you on that one, Rick. Yeah. And as long as we all understand that everyone's experience is unique and that I am not going to experiencing it, experience everything Karen experiences, it's still interesting to hear what Karen has experienced, you know, uh, it's just, uh, and what this person and that person and the other person has experienced it. You just listen to enough of them and, and it, it's very enriching and, um, you know, it's very helpful in a, in a number of ways. And, and again, without like getting fixated on needing to experience something because somebody else did, it may not be that way for you. Yeah, that's a key point. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, so you really dove into Eckhart's teaching, and he eventually invited you to teach. Yeah. Which you began to do. Yeah, and it was it was wonderful because it was never my intention. All I wanted to do was serve. It was that that thing of was still unfolding of selfless service and mm -hmm. oneness and love, and so that was really my motivation. Was wow, this is the best thing I've come across so far because it's so practical. Like yeah. I used to say, it makes it made presence portable. You know, right. very very practical, very very grounded. Did he invite many uh, people to teach? Um, I don't know. Just a handful. Back maybe? then, one or two. Okay, so you were one yeah. of those. You were one of those one or two. Well, yeah, when it's pro I'm sure it's more than that, maybe, but at that those early stages, there were maybe three, I don't know, two, yeah. three, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, hmm. it wasn't like an official organizational thing where you know huh. the, the Eckhart Tolle movement and I'm a representative of it, like a TM teacher would be. It was more like uh, I'm out here teaching and uh, Eckhart's been my inspiration. Was it that kind of thing? Uh, well, I think. Um, Eckhart in those early days wasn't interested in having an organization because mm. he could see what would happen with <laughs> the egoic things that get involved with there. Right. Uh, but when we did, the day we met, he did feel that there would be some sort of organization and I would be part of it. Like mm. that was sort of, it was just immediately recognized. Right. Um, so he invited me and gave me an endorsement and phoned people and asked them to come to my group. So it was really, but it wasn't like a formal organization at that point. So right. yeah. Okay. And I think you were about to say something else and I interrupted you. Remember what that was? Nope. Okay. doesn't matter. It'll come back if it's important. Yeah. Now, it's interesting though because how it's, uh, I will just share this. I don't, um, just a brief example or story about this. When I was volunteering as Eckhart's personal assistant or secretary or whatever, um, I would get a list of people who had phoned and made inquiries and I would contact them to see what they needed and I'd make a big list on a yellow legal pad and take it over to Eckhart and he would sort of tune into each one and direct me what to do hmm. book sessions or whatever and one day a woman phoned and while she was speaking to me this clear knowing came that I could help her hmm. I didn't say a word I didn't write it down and I took the list later that day to Eckhart and she was X number down on the list and when we got to her as always I'd say the person's name and what was happening he'd get completely still and then out of nowhere he said you can help her that's cool i know and so when things get validated like that it's pretty exciting and wonderful yeah. so that's how it started yeah it's also cool because i mean to hear you describe that that's what he did because it gives an example of the depth from which he's functioning and and the clarity of his intuition that he could just sort of I mean, if somebody read me a list like that, I'd say, I don't know, tell them to read this book or tell them to see that teacher. <laughs> but, but I don't think there'd be a, a sort of a deep, intuitive knowing of it necessarily. Um, but I, I understand how that works, and I've seen it in action many times. So it, it's, it's cool to hear that that's the way he was functioning. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was wonderful to be around somebody who lived that way, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I also have heard him say that you know he doesn't ever plan out his talks or anything. He just sort of stays in the moment. Gets in the car, goes up on the stage, opens his mouth, you know, and it just start, starts rolling out. Well, and that was a wonderful um, 
let's say role model for lack of a better word example he was modeling that so it was the same i never planned anything it would just arise out of the presence and you learn to trust it and rely on it so he was he was very authentic in that and yeah he also didn't now it was probably different now but back in those days he didn't do any kind of advertising right. it had to be organic word of mouth people came naturally so it was really a good um example that was probably pre-oprah right yes it was yeah that kind of blew it open yeah um okay so around this time the death of a loved one well you, you before that you said that your own you you had your own unique view of things because you're sharing from your own experience and it began to be began to become clear that you needed to leave this path and move on uh, that this spiritual path was not going to take you all the way it wasn't going to work um, okay hang on those are two separate things so okay. the first one was thank you uh, the first one was again I'm, I'm just reporting my experience uh -huh. and it does not it's not logical or anything but this knowing began to arise in me that I had to move on mm -hmm. but mentally no way right. so when those intuitions started to come to me I ignored them mm. I was like I'm not leaving this guy are you kidding this is he's it this is this I found where I belong and yeah. you know how awesome to hang out with him but life was relentless as always and it's really I suppose benevolence uh, it, and so I just I just circumstances came that I ended up moving away and um, yeah so there was just a need for that for whatever reason now, I'm not implying that I, I just pitched that. I mean, obviously, it's still here, right? Yeah. But in terms of my own unfolding and what was going to happen, it was something was changing. And there was some drama, which I'm not going to get into here, but there was stuff happened. Sure. So went a different way. Yeah. I mean, this is a kind of a crude example, but when you go from high school to college, you don't pitch high school. If you, if you do, you're not going to do very well in college. It's like you have that under, <laughs> you have that under your belt, and okay, now there's this, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well said. I like that very much. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, it was just time to go on to another thing or mm -hmm. whatever. And around that time, uh, that was the example you're supposed to share. Another so. A bunch of things happened, but one was there was this clear knowing that this wasn't my message. Hmm. It was Eckhart's, and it was perfect for what it was. Um, but I was here for something else. And then uh, a close relative died. And when that happened, I found myself encountering this chasm of darkness. Hmm. It was like, holy shit, after all this time, oh, sorry, no, all right. after you all this time, uh, here is this... Well, I thought it was gone. Yeah, one would think, especially with all, you know, philosophical understanding that nobody dies and all that jazz. And yeah, yeah, no, and that's the mystery of this, Rick. And I think it's it's such a mystery, but it's this thing to me. It speaks again about embodiment, but whatever. And there's also this thing of the things we go through, traumas, griefs, losses. Like that's one thing, but it felt to me like the darkness I'd felt when I was young mm -hmm. was there underneath and it, there was something and what what happened was I felt like I for me what became known was I encountered the core wound of the heart mm -hmm. that's what I was I didn't know what that was but that's what was revealed to me so I spent a year or so sitting with it and it was like having a blizzard or you know a winter wasteland in my heart center and I would sit with it and it eventually um, was let's say dissolved or healed or whatever yeah. but again co consciousness used that because it was the recognition again doing this particular practice or whatever wasn't going to take me all the way yeah the waking down people use that phrase core wound I don't know if you're aware of that but um, Samuel Bonder and that whole group but um, so when you sat with it for a year was it sort of like you really had to marinate in some dark stuff in, in order to process it? Or was it just, a, and you knew that that's what you're doing and you're just kind of, you know, processing and processing and just suffering through it until it passed? Uh, pretty much. It was, it was conscious suffering, I would say. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, but really, and it's the same thing with things that happen, arise now. It, what, what really it was about was just feeling it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and. So whatever had been avoided from what I was doing before had to be met. That's all, really, is what it was. Mm -hmm. Back in the early days, John Gray wrote a book called What You Feel You Can Heal. You know? 
or I think that was it, or what you can feel, you can heal. But basically that you have to feel it to heal it. Yeah, I agree with that. And yeah. a lot of what we're doing is we're moving away from things. You know, the, the primal mind, that survival mechanism tries to pull us away from discomfort. Yeah. So it was just really meeting that. And some other things happened at that time that were painful. It was a period of really getting grounded and, yeah, dealing with the humanness, I would say. Mm. And you kind of mentioned at this stage that you rejected all external authorities and, and just came to rely exclusively on internal guidance. And that's what I mean by the recognition that some, so in quote, external mm -hmm. teaching or method wasn't going to take me all the way, that I had to come to the, uh, the Satguru, the, the internal guidance or authority. Yeah. Have you kind of balanced that out now? I mean, because there's a lot of people around who are sort of into the be your own guru thing and, and just categorically reject external no, authorities. No, no, no. no, yeah. no. So what would you say to that? No, no, it wasn't like, it's not like that. And it wasn't even really like that then. It was more, it wasn't a rejection. It was a turning deeper within, mm -hmm. knowing that the final, well, there's no such thing as final in my opinion, but the the, the depth of realization that was, trying to happen that was happening i now needed to rely on let's say the inner wisdom for that it was yeah. it was that yeah now there was a, there was a pendulum swing because it's been a fairly dramatic unfolding and for a little while i was like okay i'm not going to do anything spiritual but <laughs> in that balance though you know my friends i would i had a joke if they came over to my house they couldn't use the s word spiritual oh. <laughs> for a while so it was just this thing and i took a corporate job and took coaching training and did all this really grounded, embodied stuff. But uh, the, the really big, real, couple of next big realizations that happened came from within. Yeah. I think it's worth pointing out that um, even if you are involved with an external teacher, so to speak, such as Eckhart Tolle or somebody else, um, any actual realization that takes place is an internal process. And, you know, there's the whole pearls before swine principle that, you know, you can, great, a great, great teacher could, could have a, a bunch of idiots around him and, and not, <laughs> nothing is going to be transmitted. So there has to be a certain depth and receptivity. It's really incumbent upon the, the student. Well, another analogy is, you know, you could have a, a vast reservoir and uh, according to the size of the pipe that you bring up to the reservoir, that much water will flow. So a, a drinking straw no matter how vast the reservoir isn't going to allow that much transmission of water. A great big pipe will, you know, result in a gusher. I totally agree. And, you know, it's, it's to be really, language is funny, you know, it, it's to be really, really precise takes more time, but um, I, I completely agree with you. And what I mean is, um, so thank you, Rick, this is excellent. Thanks. What I mean to clarify that is, let me see if I can get a little closer to it, that there was a tendency, which I think is fairly common, to project to the external as being the source, the savior, the, mm -hmm. you know, honestly, I hate to admit this, but it's true. It, it took me, like the day I met Eckhart, he said, you're here to teach presence, mm -hmm. the very first day. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Rick. It took me 10 years to realize that's because it was already here. Yeah. <laughs> so a little, little slow here. Yeah, that's a, you know, didn't get it very fast, even though he told me that directly, it's in you. It, it, so this is sort of that thing of there's a, you know, Nisargadatta had this wonderful, I'm not sure if I can quite grasp it, but it's something like, you know, maybe enlightenment or awakening, whatever. He used the analogy of a fruit tree. The, the actual realization happens instantaneously. The fruit is ripe, it falls now. Right. Okay, however, he said that, that something like the process of how it ripens and how long that takes and what it needs and how much sunlight and rain and all that, that's a mystery that we don't know. So that's kind of what we're pointing to here. So thank you for getting us back on that track. So what I noticed was a tendency to have everything, the authority was external, not internal. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. Yeah, and uh, and I think it's interesting when people shift from uh, being externally oriented to an, a more internal reliance. There there can be a tendency to throw the baby out with the bathwater and to, to sort of you know just whew, reject the thing. 
But um, I think a more mature balance would be that, you know, one appreciates everything that one has derived from the external authority, but then fully internalizes it and, re you know, and, and substantiates it in one's own experience. Yeah, that's the ideal. That's the pattern. That's the archetype. So then there's just this question of, you know, in my case, I was, you know, really far on the scale of, of having no sense of internal authority. But I, I totally agree with you. And mm. it's not like it was rejected, but there was, a, again, sometimes the fire is needed. So I needed to back away from looking to someone else to have my answer or whatever yeah. realization and come within. But there were moments, you know, around this time I bumped into my friend Pamela Wilson. Uh, let's talk about uh, her in a second. I just wanted to throw in a, oh, a, sure. a note that um, it seems like I'm, you know, just to get psychological on you for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goody. <laughs> Which I'm totally unqualified to do. But it, it seems like you did have a little bit of a, a lifelong syndrome of looking to external authorities um, and having a little bit lack of confidence in your own authority. I mean, there was this relationship thing, then the guy was sort of like as much a guru as a partner and perhaps other instances, instances in your life of that. I completely confess that. And I said, yeah. thank you. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. So in my case, there was a need to sort of rebel or reject it temporarily mm -hmm. and as, as a fiery way to really ensure that I came within somebody who's more balanced. I think that's really what my story is, is a confession of, Rick, is like I said, neuroses and, and whatever. So whatever my own issues were, that's in some way you could say what determined the path. But thank you. I, I totally agree with that. And that's why maybe there was such a swing here yeah. and a need to go within. And probably these shifts in your life, um, you know, various transitions you went through that we've been talking about were really just the external symptoms of stages of maturation that you were going through internally you know and when a, when a certain stage of self-sufficiency had been reached then there was a natural sloughing off of of this or that external authority and, and a more and a standing more on your own feet oh i love that thank you what a great insight yes that's really wonderful okay. yeah i agree out of the mouths of babes <laughs> wonderfully said way to go <laughs> yes it's it's wonderful you can you're you're a great listener i really appreciate that that's um, that was good listening and good insight. So, Thank you. Yeah. So Pamela, good old Pamela. I'm going to be seeing oh. Pamela in about 10 days at, at the Science and Non-Duality Conference. Oh, I love her. Yeah. So we both started uh, teaching or, or at, the, at the same time. And so I attended her satsang right from the beginning and loved it. She's mm. wonderful. Yeah. So she's always been teacher, friend, mentor, big sister, whatever. But around this time when I was going through that pendulum swing of rejecting the external authorities, um, I bumped into her and I'd stopped going to satsang at this period. It's like, okay, I've got to get it within. And, but she, you know, so insightful right away, just recognized that this was just part of the integration embodiment phase, sort of like the insight that you just had. And it really helped. And I, there was an, enough openness to hear that and receive it. And it was, so there was good clarification and, um, it was helpful. Yeah. Pamela was, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Pamela was very, very helpful through this whole phase up until now. Uh, really insightful and so gracious and generous and, and wise. So I adore her. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, and for those listening, I, I interviewed Pamela quite a few years ago. And so you'll find that on BatGap. And uh, oh, she definitely should interview her again one of these days. She, she's a good one. <clears throat> um, so can you like explicitly, or can you can actually, aside from our mutual admiration of Pamela, can you say more specifically how your interaction with her, um, you know, facilitated your, your process? Well, that first one, well, that, that particular one was, it just, it just made it more obvious. Consciousness became more focused on, okay, that's what's happening. Mm. So then the pendulum stopped swinging. Okay, what's what's happening? Uh, this is just embodiment. This is just integration. I see, I see. It's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it just helped to light that up. I was just in my experience, but this made it more uh, clear, mm -hmm. the sort of theme of it. And then over the next few years, every time I sat with her or saw her or whatever, it would be um, a deeper invitation. Like at one point, I, I had a dream about her, and she she came to me, and, you know, 
I wouldn't call this a dream really, but it happened when One I was asleep. Things, yeah. uh, but she said, join me in freedom. And I had just, I was just about to go to one of her retreats. And so I got there and I went to see her and said, wow, you came to me in, in a dream and you, you said, join me in, in freedom. And she said, no, I said, join me in total freedom. Hmm. And it was one of those moments, Rick, where something just responded and it was pretty special. It was, yeah. So she just really kept encouraging um, that deeper understanding, resting in acceptance of that this unfoldment was happening. Yeah. I think it's interesting to point out that um, despite the fact that you had already been a spiritual teacher in your own right, um, you had the humility, if, if that's the right word, and um, sincerity to sit with another spiritual teacher to, to further your progress. You know, you, you had no sort of sense that you were beyond the need of any kind of guidance or, or inspiration. You know, Pamela is a great model of that. She, she'll she sit with who she resonates with as well. And mm -hmm. there's all, you know, Nisargadatta, again, he said something about uh, people tend to focus with him on when he, the non-dual part, what we traditionally call non-dual of mm -hmm. the no self. And all, But, you know, there was, there's all these passages where he talks about, you know, this exploration of, you know, the, he said something like, I love this, wish I could remember the exact quote, but something like the recognition of what we aren't is finite. We come to the end of that inquiry because, mm -hmm. you know, we see through it. But the investigation into what we are is infinite. I yeah, love that. I love that too. I saw that recently. I don't know if it was in notes you sent me or what. Maybe not. But um, maybe it was in that thing you did with Gary Nixon. You did an interview. Maybe. Yeah. But that's a great quote. And that's kind of one of my guiding principles. Oh, it's, you know, it's so wonderful. When we talk about the, that major realization I had, we're about to talk about, uh, that's when that really came to me. But it's like, so yeah, why not? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. Repeat that I'm, again. I've so since so, so it's, it's so important. Just say it one more time. Okay. Um, okay. Something like the investigation into the false, what we aren't, is finite. We come to the end of that because that's a fictional self. It's a mm -hmm. finite object. However, the investigation, the um, experience, the unfolding into what we are is infinite because what we are is infinite. That's great. And yeah. uh, just, to, from the, just to throw in a little thing about mathematics, and I'm not a mathematician, but I've heard this in lectures that, you know, in mathematics there are infinities and infinities and infinities. I mean, you can take infinity and it's, it's big, it's infinity, but then add one to it or square it, multiply it times itself. And so you have a bigger infinity. And, oh. you know, <laughs> it's so like there's no end to it. You, you can do that endlessly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of people I really resonate with. And Pamela Wilson is, you know, for years, that's the only person I w sat, was drawn to sit with. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and I typically go to her summer retreat every year. And it's just a wonderful celebration. And always, you know, why not? Yeah. Why not have a... Who mentor? else do you resonate with? Oh, gosh. Uh, right this moment, Isaac Shapiro. Oh, yeah. Isaac is great. He's wonderful. He was just in Calgary, and I was happened to be talking to Pamela on the phone, and, and I said he was here, and she said, go. <laughs> and I was like, okay, and I went, and it was wonderful, because yeah. he helps with, it's, it's a, for me, it's a really important piece of embodiment, which is the uh, getting the nervous system to relax and d different ways to deal with trauma, and yeah, that's, that's an area of interest to me. So, yeah, I think he's wonderful. There are others, uh, just their names aren't coming to me right now. Susanna Marie, who you've interviewed. Oh, yeah. I'll be seeing yeah. her in 10 days, too. She's coming. Yeah, she's lovely. Yeah, that's cool. Just a little Isaac Shapiro story. Um, a couple of years ago at the Sand Conference, I, I already interviewed him, and I first encountered him in, at breakfast in the dining room, and I said, Isaac, hi, it's Rick Archer. And he kind of looked, he put down his tray, and then he turned to me and just gave me this wonderful hug with full attention. He wasn't going to sort of do it with his tray in his hands or anything like that. And just was like totally focused and great heart is like getting hugged by a big warm bear or something. Um, and, and then he kind of hung around and came to a bunch of other stuff I, had, I was doing at the conference, interviewing this and that person, participating in a group discussion. So I really, uh, really liked Isaac a lot and hope to see him mm. again soon. 
Wonderful. Yeah, he is so genuine and, and yeah, really, really appreciate him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice what we're touching on right now, this sort of mutual admiration society of people who are, you know, peers in, in some respects, but each who, who each have their own gifts and whose gifts we may not have and uh, from whom we can derive benefit, you know, and, and we're never kind of beyond the point of enriching our own life, our own, you know, perspective by being with one of these other people. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. It's it's lovely to watch the different areas of um, specialty or focus or grace or gift or intelligence coming through. And uh, yeah, why not? Yeah. It's like doctors never stop going to conferences and all where they can hear other specialists in their field, you know, say something that they might not know so much about. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Where are we here in your notes? Um, are we getting close to the end? Nah, I think so, right? It's infinite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you should get a little prize for that. It was very witty. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go on for okay, another, I remember. We'll go on for another 20, 20 minutes, maybe at most. Okay. Uh, so yeah. um, last couple of highlights then and I'll string them together. So okay. um, at this around this time I just started to sit again, but just to sit. Uh, and In I wasn't a meditative sense. Yeah. I wasn't teaching or doing anything, but I just got this urge to sit. So one day, soon after that, I was sitting and spon just spontaneously Ramana's inquiry came. Mm. Uh, and the it came with who am I, but then it changed form into who's thinking. Mm. And just in that moment, there was a recognition that there is no thinker. And it hadn't been seen that clearly before. I mean, there's been all big chunks of, you know, became like cheesecloth, but still. Uh, and so there was just this clarity and thinking stopped for, I don't know, two or three days, whatever it was. And so there was just this natural functioning without that interpreter or the middleman, I think Adi Shanti called it. And so it was, it was lovely. And um, when the first thought sort of flickered in, it was it was just okay it realized it was just clear now because it can it's a potential danger of teachings like Eckhart's that if people you know we all do our own trip with this stuff right and a lot of people I mean a lot of people I talked to over the years and I did it myself you, you almost make thought into an enemy and that's an, that's mm -hmm. a misunderstanding and so I think in the background there might have been a little bit still of feeling that thought was inferior or whatever and so when it came back in, it was like, oh, how sweet. It was like a bird moving through. And so then there was just a, a deeper relaxation into thought after that. However, I noticed after this, um, occasionally there would be uh, what I would call suffering would arise. Hmm. And even though it was understood that that's something psychological, whatever, sometimes it would still arise. So there was this growing recognition, okay, something's been overlooked. And so that, once again, that real intensity that had built several times uh, that I've shared and other times besides that started to build again. I was like, okay, something's, something's cooking, cool. And this was a time when, again, it was just really clear. I'm not talking to, it wasn't a, even a rejection. It was just clarity. I'm not looking anywhere for the answer to this. I've tried all the greats and here suffering still arising. I gotta find the answer to this myself. It was just clear seeing. So a couple of things happened, and I don't remember which order, but just to compress it in the interest of time. And this suffering one, was some kind of emotional suffering, would we say? Uh, yeah, psychological. Yeah, psychological, okay. Yeah. The main thing, what I ended up seeing was, so there were two areas that was showing up. One was in illness. Mm -hmm. I had a few chronic illnesses that were still coming, and I didn't, even though there'd been a lot of investigation and you know, presence around around them, there was still something there and I didn't recognize what it was. So when I started to really get very intense with the inquiry, I recognized, oh, there's just a an, a, um, a remaining sense of, of an identity in there. Mm -hmm. The illness itself was given reality. Uh, so when the symptoms would come up, just very subtly, there'd be that sense of the history of this thing and it would be projected into the future. Like, this illness was an entity and that's a form of identification. Mm. So I just clearly saw that. And so with a couple of illnesses, uh, um, one in particular, 
when I was doing the inquiry, I saw that and the symptoms stopped on the spot and have never come back. That's neat. And it was, sorry? That's neat, I said, yeah. Oh, it was, it was incredible. It's like, whoa, this is really powerful. Yeah. So there's an awful lot of investigation into things at that time and after that. So that was a big one. There was a second illness where that happened with, but in the interest of full disclosure, I did have an experimental treatment with that one. So you never know if maybe that mm. finally kicked in, but on the spot, the, the thing itself was over. That's cool. So it was two major areas. I was debilitated. I really couldn't function for a few years. So it's pretty strong. Wow. It's interesting to think, you know, you, you're doing that for yourself. It's interesting to think of examples such as they're in the Bible where Christ, you know, heals some leper or paralyzed person or something like that, probably through the same principle, but kind of a, with such a profound degree of mastery so, so to, yeah. be, to be able to do it with somebody else like that. Absolutely. And of course, you have to know it here first. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's the thing. And so right around that time, the other thing that was happening was what I came to see was there was suffering about suffering. Hmm. There was just this little remaining sort of sense of the one who was supposed to end suffering. And I didn't hmm. recognize I'd taken that on. Uh, so anytime suffering arose, this little imaginary entity felt thwarted. Oh no, it's come again. I've failed. <laughs> so it was causing this angst, I guess. And it, it was also the sense that I'm supposed to unconsciously had taken on. I was supposed to end suffering for all of humanity. So like <laughs> this big thing, right? So just sitting down and I, I just got this real intensity and I actually heard out loud, that's enough. And I knew what it meant. It meant that's enough of this. Let's. So I sat down and this intensity rose. I'm not getting off this chair until I see through this. And right away through the inquiry, it just that sense, fictional sense of self was seen through. It's seen, oh, it's just in the mind. And then that whole sense of the mind made self just sort of collapsed like a house of cards kind of, kind of experience. Interesting. And you said as a result of this, I think this is the, as a result of that, that an enormous energy and aliveness arose that lasted for about 18 months. Yeah. So, uh, you know, one way we could talk about that is perhaps the life force that had been, I mean, this is just a conceptual thing, mm -hmm. but that had been trapped in sustaining that remaining sense of self was freed up. So, I don't know, Rick. No, that's a good point. I mean, I think a lot of life force is, is caught up in... So, you, you, you know, remember an hour ago, you were talking about how you looked at that person in the car and, and you could sense that they were trapped in, in the ego and, and what a, implicit in the way you said that was that the tremendous amount of energy is, is tied up in maintaining that um, structure, you know, and it's a common report and an observation of people who are highly liberated, deeply liberated, that there's this tremendous outpouring of energy that just have you know, inf inf what's the word? Infatigable. Inf <laughs> just, you know what I'm trying to say. It's just yeah, a, yeah. In create a dynamism, you know, a tremendous dynamism. Yeah, it's exciting. And I feel like part of this Indefagable, I think that's the That's way. it. Yeah. Well done. I wasn't even going to attempt it. I'm like, wait a second, I'm going to think about that. Uh, and I think part of the purpose of this, I've seen this a lot of times with some of the... Um, teachers or masters or whatever, when you look at their life story, there's a period after they've had another realization. And, you know, this is just conceptual, but just see if this resonates. It's like part of the purpose of that outpouring mm -hmm. is so that it can go into the collective and, and, you know, touch. It's like a tuning fork, making that possible for others. And I did see yeah. some of that happening over that period because mm -hmm. I shared some of this for a while. Uh, with other people, did some sort of non-dual pointing and whatever for a while. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but it's interesting because right away though, after a very brief period, um, life just took a left turn mm -hmm. and just completely stopped. It's interesting. A couple things happened. One, I didn't recognize there'd still been a, um, a, a momentum to sort of like spiritual or seeking activities. And I didn't notice till after this, it's like I oftentimes use the analogy of it's like there was a generator that was plugged in and I didn't know it was there and it was generating the seeking mechanisms mm. all day long. Yeah. And then with this recognition, it's like the plug got pulled mm. and that stuff stopped. I didn't even know, notice it's after the fact. One day I was sitting and I was this sort of sense of boredom arose. I'm like, boredom, I never have that. What's this? So when I looked at it, it's like, oh, I'm not doing all that spending eight hours a day 
meditating and reading books and all that. I'm just being. Mm. And it was, it was interesting. So right away, though, life was, I, I just, it started moving into going to school, taking courses, getting a job, sort of um, counterintuitive to what you think would, would happen necessarily after that. Well, it's like that dyeing the cloth analogy I used a while back, you know, whereas there's a, a dipping and a bleaching and a dipping and a bleaching. So you, your, your life seems to have gone through these cycles where, yes. you know, you, you dive deep and then you integrate. Yes, that's exactly what it is. It's just funny because it seems like the traditional pattern is you just with each realization, you just, you know, go deeper into your teaching or whatever. But that's never been my thing. I, you know, I never started out to be a teacher. And so it kind of drops off and then comes back. Anyway, so it was, it was definitely followed by a period of very intense um, integration. Yeah, it's funny. Somebody emailed me a, a few days ago about this interview and said, what, what is it with Karen? She's a teacher. She's not a teacher. She's a teacher. She's not a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I think we've explained it. <laughs> there it is. And also, you know, part of the process, because I never started out that way, yeah. but I did notice this was, there's so many other things. I mean, as with, I'm sure most of your guests, you could probably talk all day, but there's a, one of the patterns that happened is, after when I, you know, when you watch the intelligence, Rick, you know how it is. So the intelligence of one of the things that happened by pulling me away from uh, being part of Eckhart's uh, organization or whatever was it exposed something that I hadn't seen. And that was just innocently. I never started to be a teacher. It happened organically. Mm -hmm. But behind the scenes, there was some identification that had risen, had arisen with the teacher role. Mm -hmm. So every one of these gaps, it's just exposed something. And it's, it's very intelligent and beneficent is perfect mm. so in that particular case it's like oh and a couple of other times i mean i'd go through a shift and then i'd go back and sit in the chair and i'd be looking to see if there was any teacher present and as and there wasn't uh -huh. and after when i couldn't find any then it's like teaching sort of fell away even more mm. but it's not my it's not a thing for me it's just life when something's realized you know it wants to be shared yeah. but it's not i don't it's not sort of my main thing it's just incidental almost well, like we were saying in the beginning, you know, we're all instruments of the divine and um, it's gratifying to the instrument and it's beneficial to the whoever, whomever the in instrument influences to serve in that role. And, and we all have different roles to play. There are as many instruments as there are people. Yes, I agree. And um, the other thing is that life was also, this whole thing was, you know, who knows, because we're not done yet. I mean, when I get to the end of life, if you're still around, I can send you a note and say, hey, this is how it turned out. <laughs> but one of the things I've seen is there's an intelligence to this unfolding, and it's brought me to another place, another way of, let's say, serving or being with people mm -hmm. that's just more appropriate and authentic at this point. Um, I, all, I always, not always, but the last few years when I was performing a teaching function, there was this recognition of, now, I'm not making a blanket statement, I'm talking about my experience, but there was this sense of everything, whatever that is here is there also. But when this one sits in the chair, it creates the separation. And I really, really invited people to look beyond that and try different formats. But I noticed there, it, it, there's, there was almost, it almost like reinforced that sense of there's something here that you don't have. and because I'm sitting in the chair, I'm going to give it to you. So there was part of me just being really um, aware of that. And it's, it, with some teachers, it's not an issue. It really doesn't matter. But here, it's just there was just this, there's something about empowerment really is the underlying theme of whoever I'm serving or that function is being performed. It's like there's, there's a real desire for empowerment and the way that it works best here right now is more one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. But so there's this other thing too that was taking me out of that traditional teacher format. It worked for a while. Maybe it'll happen again, but it's not my primary thing. It's not my primary love. So life was also coming into a more appropriate form for my temperament or whatever. Yeah. Even one-on-one, -on -one, it's like, okay, I'm signing up to have a consultation with Karen. You know, it's not, she's not signing up to have one with me. I'm signing up to have one with her. You know, so there's still, even there, there's going to be that, that potential, you know, imbalance in, in the roles perhaps. But, um, I don't know. I, have you, we, we could probably talk about how you or how other teachers have dealt with this issue. And, um, 
But I, I also have, don't have a problem with somebody having more to offer than the average person. I mean, you know, Ramana Maharshi, for instance, uh, had something, and it was appropriate that he was the guru in that ashram. But I think he also did things to humble himself, like working in the kitchen and, you know, just kind of showing that uh, despite his specialness, he was an ordinary guy in, in a way. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree, and, you know, there's there's nothing wrong, and I'm perfectly happy to go and sit with, I just sat with Isaac, and mm -hmm. he was in the chair, and with him, he's he's really found this beautiful way of being so inclusive, and it really works for me, same with Pamela, um, and yeah, I, I agree with you, and just for my own unfoldment, there's just been periods where it just hasn't felt right to sit in that format, that's yeah. all, it's, it's really not a big deal. Oh, yeah, I yeah. mean... I, I totally understand, and uh, I was a TM teacher for 25 years, and and that was quite a while ago, and I don't have any inclination, to, uh, nor do I feel at all qualified to be a teacher now. It's just um, I'm definitely in, in ongoing student mode, if we want to put it that way. It's well, doing something that I'm good at and that's appropriate for me to do, serving in the way I can serve. That's beautiful. I love that. That's how I feel. It's just... However, life is going to use these instruments. That's gorgeous, and thank goodness you do what you do, Rick, because it's such a service to the sangha. It's wonderful. So, yay! Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, I appreciate that, and I think to each their own. And there's and it's something also Pamela helped me to see as well when I the last time when it's just is like, no, you got to stop this. This intelligence is like, take off, take down your website, <laughs> put up your shingle, you know, forget it. Yeah. And it was just, again, this knowing that something new wanted to emerge and, and everything known had to dissolve. And I just happened to see Pamela around that time and she's, you know, I didn't say anything to her. And she said, yeah, things are, you know, something new is trying to come through you and it won't until you let this mm. die. So I did. And also something was revealed through that process that had been overlooked, yeah. which was perfect. And once I saw that, everything changed. And it was this... Uh, underlying little concept, innocent, heartfelt, actually, um, overlooked belief, misunderstanding that had come along many years ago and had been unseen, which was that um, the idea was my worth or value only comes through serving. Mm. And of course, it's just for, through being. Mm. That's our worth and value. So that was seen and that came to rest and then everything started to go get going again so yeah. it's kind of kind of neat and one follows from the other because if you serve without adequately being then what sort of service are you actually providing you know sure yeah. sure absolutely but again this is a story of um everything being brought to light that can be that's in any way obscuring or limiting the experience and i think that's the journey we're all on so that's my story yeah and i love how the way you've continued i love the way you've continued to refer to an intelligence which is kind of larger or wiser than ourselves which keeps guiding us you know and uh, we keep sort of being nudged or kicked or you know <laughs> tickled or whatever to to you know take what it or to benefit from what it's trying to to accomplish with us yeah you know and it's interesting um, one other little tidbit here that comes back to you Rick is um, uh, a number of years ago, I don't remember, we could look it up, uh, I, I just, this inquiry started to arise once there was a real stability in whatever this is, and there was this knowing that, you know, all those other faculties, where are they? There was this sort of sense that there was going to be a way that this all could come together. It was just an intuitive knowing, but I was just in the unknown and just sensing that coming. And then I got this intuition one day to turn on your show. Hmm. And you happened to be interviewing Mercedes Kirkle. Uh -huh. And when I heard her story, I knew that was going to be a similar story for me. Hmm. Someone who had been with a teacher, had their awakening, and then their life took a very dramatic turn and started doing something kind of woo-woo, yeah. <laughs> you know, spiritual out there. And it was, so I'm grateful to you because that, I wouldn't have found my way to her, I'm sure, without that. Hmm. And But during the telling of her story, it goes back to what you said earlier, it's like everything in me, just like when I touched the power of now, everything went zzz, huh. and I knew it was kind of a clue. So thank you for that. Cool. I, I love hearing those little stories, and, and I'm sure they're, for every one I hear, there are thousands that I don't hear, but it's, a, it's kind of a joy to be uh, 
Marshi Mahesh Yogi once told me I was a, con a connector and a collector. So I, I kind of like playing that connector role. And, and you know, there, there was a connection you just described that I wasn't aware of. But um, it's, it's really fun kind of plugging people into, unwittingly most of the time, to, to situations or opportunities or other, other people that are going to benefit them or facilitate their, their growth. That's a great thing about your show. Yeah. So that's kind of what ended up happening um, is that Dimension just started to open up again. And I started just, again, I had an intuition and it was validated externally, like some of the other stuff I've shared. And I just started to sit with people and man, it's, it's amazing to me. Every session I'm like, wow, uh, I, I never know what to expect. It's just this sense of oneness and love and whatever shows up and watching what happens for people it's i just it's just love and gratitude is is my experience it's uh, it's wonderful yeah and in your notes here you say that in these sessions psychic information often comes that is helpful in healing releasing or embracing life circumstances and each session is unique and arises out of the field of oneness with no imposition of any teaching or formula um, so it's sort of like it came full circle with that psychic information thing. It's, it's kind of come back again, but in a different context, a much more solid foundation. Yeah, and there's, it's, just, it's just whatever rises because there's no filter or, like you said, a, there's no imposition. Of, this is another reason it seems to me that those uh, um, times of teaching and the messages and whatever, why they've uh, dissolved is because now there's just nothing imposed. Where before, through, through certain periods, for example, with Eckhart's teaching, I might be teaching the inner body awareness or whatever, or uh, might do non-dual pointing or whatever. Now there's just nothing except what arises. And mm. it's always perfect for what that person needs in this point of their journey and their evolution. So talk about being an instrument. That's exactly what it is. So everything to me feels like it all fit together. The seeing through the fictional self there's nobody here who needs to be a teacher or anything else there's just life love oneness and it moves and touches and sometimes it's physical healing sometimes it's emotional sometimes it's awakening sometimes it's embodiment you know clarification it's just whatever so it's it's pretty cool that's neat you become a spiritual jack of all trades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other part of that is master of none. But right. that's the beauty, you know, just to be so transparent and open and available. Uh, it's a joy. And so the one shows up in an apparent other form. And the, you know, these two, it's communion. Yeah. And it's, I love it. It's very wonderful. So you're doing many of these sessions? Yeah. Like... People it's obviously a, listening to this who want to have one, they just go to your website, karenmcphee.com, and find out how to do it? Yes. Um, I'm still working on my website. It's fairly new, but they can just email me and book a session. I do Skype sessions just about every day. And mm -hmm. I also have a couple of beautiful, um, one is a, a crystal bookstore here in town and another bookstore that also has crystals. Uh, so there's some uh, spiritual centers here locally that I'll, I go and do sessions at those. And in my... Uh, my place so yeah on yeah. the phone most yeah. of the people who are watching this obviously aren't going to be in Calgary but no um, they'll they'll want to Skype you if they want to do that yeah. yeah it's it's amazing to me well I'm sure you know but Skype it's it's virtually the same as being there yeah. it's it's pretty cool yeah. yeah so yeah great okay well this has been wonderful I think we've really covered it quite thoroughly um, is there are there any little lingering thoughts that you might want to bring out that you're going to think of five minutes after we hang up <laughs> <laughs> probably but nothing comes to mind i guess except that just the invitation um for everyone to well recognize i mean this is a journey yes. and there as far as i can tell there isn't a destination it's ever unfolding and so gratitude to you rick for having the opportunity to share and also being able to witness so many other people's story of their unfolding. I feel it's really serving us all. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just, you know, hey, keep, keep, keep on trucking because life keeps unfolding. It gets better and better and better. And as we come into our own inner authority and really embody this reality, life 
it just comes into right alignment and it's pretty, pretty gorgeous. Mm. There's a saying that the goal is all along the path. Um, so it's not like we have to sort of pass over today for some glorious future. Uh, the future may be more glorious than today is, but there's a lot of glory in the moment too, which I'm sure is very Eckhart-like to, to, oh. to say, you know. It's so true. You know, I'm in love with life. Mm. And even through the hardships, that's, that has been a common theme here is loving that which is unfolding at all. And, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty delicious even when it's challenging. And it is. It's, to me, it's a love affair with the divine, with life. And, yeah, it's pretty cool. Great. All right. Well, let me make some wrap-up points. Um, first of all, thanks to those who, um, who surmounted our technical difficulties and, and listened to the live streaming version of this. It looks like there have been about 20 or 30 people on throughout the call. Um, sometimes it's 50 to 80, but that's when we're doing it every week and there aren't any glitches. So <laughs> appreciate your del diligence in, in tuning into that. And um, nobody submitted questions, but in future, if, uh, if you're watching the live stream and you have a question, there's a form at the bottom of, bottom of the upcoming interviews page and you're welcome to submit one. Um, so this interview with Karen has been, as you probably know, one in an ongoing series. Uh, there have been well over 300 now, and if you'd like to um, check out the past ones, go to the past interviews menu on batgap.com, and you'll see them categorized in four or five different ways. Um, there is also the future interviews menu when you can, where you can see what's coming up, and there's an audio podcast of this, which almost as many people listen to as watch the video. So there are people commuting and bike riding and whatnot listening to it. So there's a page where you can see the various options to sign up for that. There's the donate button, as I mentioned, which makes it possible for us to do this. And um, from the outset, my concept was to just make this freely available and grow it to the point where voluntary donations would make it self-supporting. And it's moving in that direction, so I appreciate that. And it enables people in very far-flung places to watch this who otherwise wouldn't be able to if there were any kind of entry fee. Um, and there's an email sign-up thing. People have been saying, why, why no new interviews? Why no new interviews? But, um, you know, if you sign up for the, because I was, you know, away, we are on vacation, I went to Vancouver, but if you sign up to be notified by email each time a new one is posted, you'll just know uh, within 24 hours after it's posted. So feel free to do that. All right, well, thanks for listening or watching, and we will see you next week. The next one is Andrew Harvey, which if you're not familiar with him, it's going to be a total delight. I'm, he's, he's an amazing guy. I've been kind of tuned into him for at least 20 years, and he's a beautiful man. So see you then.